semester where we will get an update from our awesome panel who is providing um, an update on the memorial to the enslaved. I am Juwan Johnson, the new postdoctoral fellow for the Lemon Project, and I'm happy to join the William & Mary community. Um, a little bit about me um, is I earned my PhD from Inheritage Studies from Arkansas State University with a concentration in African American history. Um, my reach, uh, re recent research focuses on the ways that Black cultural spaces, namely churches, are terrorized, and I investigate the impact of losing a place that is deeply tied to our collective memory. Um, my background is also in public history, where I've worked uh, with predominantly African American communities to preserve the history and heritage of home spheres and home spaces. And I look forward to collaborating with the descendant community on genealogical research initiatives that further give voice to, and name to enslave ancestors with ties to William and Mary. And I'm excited about our conversation tonight. So hopefully um, the ancestors whom we are memorializing will shine grace upon us not to experience a Zoom meeting crash. Um, so tonight I'm gonna just kind of lay out in terms of where we're headed. Um, I'm gonna introduce each of the panel members and then um, they will tell a bit about um, how they're tied to the project. And then I'll proceed to asking them specific questions that you all have submitted uh, for this recorded session. I also want to note that you can feel free to use the chat feature um, if you have additional questions and my co-host Sarah Thomas who is working in the background uh, to ensure um, she will ensure that the questions are answered. Um, so again thank you for joining us tonight and we're going to move forward um, with introducing the panel. Um, the first person uh, we have up is um, Dr. Jody Allen. Again thank you Dr. Allen for joining the panel this evening. I, would you um, like to tell us a bit about yourself and how you're tied to this project? Okay, thank you, Juwan. Um, I am uh, an assistant professor of history at William & Mary and a William & Mary alum. I, I'm also the director of the Lemon Project and so have been working um, toward this memorial for a very long time. Thank you so much for that introduction. Next, we have um, Sean Glover. Thank you for joining us. Yes, good evening. My name is Sean Glover and I serve as the university's chief diversity officer. I also was a member of the Lemon Project steering committee and for the memorial, I serve as the co-chair of the building committee. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we have um, Ed Pease. Mute. You're muted, Ed. I you're muted. Sorry about that. Thanks, Juwan. Um, yeah, I'm a senior lecturer in art and art history. I teach the architecture studio. And I was, I'm, along with Susan and Jody, one of the co-chairs for the Lemon Project Committee on Memorialization. And I also I have an architectural practice in, in Williamsburg. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, we have um, Bert Pinnock. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bert Pinnock. I'm a principal and I head the community and cultural studio at Baskerville. Um, our studio focuses on many things, uh, not the least of which has been projects like uh, the Richmond Slave Trail, the Reconciliation Statute Project, the Black History Museum. Um, we're currently working on engagement at, at the Reclamation of the Bearing Ground at the University of Richmond. And we are the architects for the memorial. So please be here. Thank you so much. We're going to get into the questions. Um, we're going to kind of start out um, with competition. Uh, we had several um, questions about the memorial competition process and how uh, the hearth design concept was chosen. And um, I'd like to um, ask a few questions that we received uh, regarding that. So I'll start with you, Ed. Um, can you talk about um, the course memorializing uh, the enslaved of William and Mary that you co-taught with Dr. Allen in fall of 2014 and what came out of that course? Sure, but, but first we forgot Susan Kern. Oh. Who's I do apologize for that. She, she, she did appear, <laughs> so here she is. So, well, let's, let's, let's take a step back. Thank you for <laughs> noting that she didn't show up on my screen. Um, Susan, welcome uh, to the discussion. Uh, would you like to tell us how you're tied to this project? Uh, thanks, Joanne, and th thanks, Ed. Um, yes, uh, I'm executive director of Historic Campus, so my, my 
part in this is helping uh, change the ways we think about campus uh, as a site of slavery. Uh, I'm also teaching the history department. I'm on the Lemon Project steering committee, and I've been on the um, the committee for memorialization. So I've been part of this project not quite as long as Jody and Ed, but uh, almost as long. <clears throat> Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. I appreciate that. Glad you're here tonight. So we'll go back to you, Ed. Let's um, go back to the question about the course that you taught on memorializing and uh, the enslaved of William and Mary, and uh, what came out of that course in fall of 2014. Sure. Um, Jody and I met uh, you know, before 2014, obviously, she was here for the Lemon Project, and I had done um, as a kind of imaginary project in my architecture studio, um, a, what we called at the time a slavery memorial that was located in Colonial Williamsburg. And we invited Jody and Susan and a number of other faculty and um, locals um, to come to some critiques and that's how we met and of course that I, the idea had been around to do one uh, uh, to do a memorial to the enslaved on campus before that but um, anyway that's kind of how we connected and Jody approached me with the idea of co-teaching this class and um, which was exciting to me I'd never taught anything other than these architecture studios so the way that worked was Jody as a historian taught the, the history component and her idea, which I completely agreed with, was to have a, a, a design component um, so that hopefully the students as maybe a final project could design their own memorial. So that's the way it went. And I think we can all, Jody and I would agree, and I believe the students too, that it was a really challenging and inspiring uh, semester to, to delve into all that. And um, as to what it led to, I, th I think the idea of a competition, um, and Jody, please feel free to interject and correct my faulty memory, but I think um, the idea of a competition kind of emerged from the class. And one strong influence for that was we watched a documentary about about Maya Lin and the Vietnam Memorial. Um, I think it's called a Strong Clear Vision. And it was just, it, they had a, the first third of that documentary is, was about the competition for the Vietnam Memorial. Um, and it was really inspiring and intriguing and fascinating. And it just, you know, when we, when, as we, as we finished the class and decided to create this committee on memorialization, the big question was how do we, how does this work? How do we choose someone or how do we find the right person to design it? And it was a pretty unanimous decision early on to do a competition. And um, I think, again, I think, I think the myelin story was a big factor in all that. So I think if I had to have, you know, one overly simplified takeaway from that semester is that that was kind of the impetus to get started for the competition. Thanks for that. Jody, did you want to follow up on that before we proceed to the next question? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> uh, after all these months, you think I had that down. <laughs> um, no, I was saying, I think Ed did a good job of you know, capturing um, the class and, um, you know, how, you know, how we started it and um, kind of, as he said, that the committee, um, the Lemon Project Committee on Memorialization came directly out of the class. And so, so that spring, uh, we taught it in fall of 2014 and spring of 2015, the committee started meeting and we've been meeting ever since. So, um, yeah. Okay. I also noticed that we have an additional 120 guests. And so um, thank you all for joining us. Um, and welcome to this uh, update on the um, Memorial Project. And we're gonna move on to the next question. Uh, and this is a question to you, Jody. Um, it um, states, one person describes the Vietnam Veterans Memorial approach to honoring uh, the enslaved um, as being overwrought and asked, um, could we just not 
um, put up, could we just not put up a statue of some sort? Um, it says another person asks, what other design submissions did you receive and why did you choose um, that one? So I guess we can start with um, either one of those questions. Okay, well, as, as Ed mentioned, the, um, during the class, he showed us the documentary on the making of, of the Vietnam Memorial. And I think what moved the class you know, about it was that it was open to anyone anyone could enter. Um, Maya Lynn, I believe, was a 21 or 22 year old college student when she entered and she won. And, you know, and so the, it wasn't so much, I'm not sure what the person means by it being, you know, overwrought. It wasn't like we were planning it to look like the Vietnam Memorial, but it, what inspired the, the, the committee was the act of the competition, you know, Traditionally, a lot of these um, types of um, projects are um, filled with uh, uh, competitions that come as a result of an RFP, which, which, which includes only professionals in the field. And we wanted it to be open to students, um, to your grandmother, to uh, just to anybody. And so for a competition, to have a competition, anyone could, you know, could enter. And so that's the way, um, you know, that's the way the committee thought it was best to do. And so out of that competition, we had 84 entries, 80 were um, submitted correctly and were eligible. Uh, we ended up with people from 16 states and four continents. And we did have um, some William and Mary students um, and administrators who entered. And we did have um, someone who I think was probably someone's grandmother based on the notes she sent. And so it was a real uh, wide range of people. Um, and the way it was chosen was we had a, it was a completely blind process. We had a um, uh, jurors that, and no, there were only two people, um, none of the jurors knew. And there were two people who knew, who had seen the, um, uh, the drawings that were submitted and the, um, the narratives that were submitted. And then that was only so they could make sure the, that they, you know, the, that we had the right name with the, the right piece. Uh, but it, everything was numbered. And so the nine jurors met um, and went over everything, all of the, the entries, and came up with the um, three that they submitted then to um, the president, President Rowe, and she presented one of those three to the um, Board of Visitors and they approved. So that's how we um, ended up with that um, particular design. Yeah. I'm curious as to the other continents. As you mentioned, there were four. Oh, it's been a long time. Um, well, I know Africa, Asia, Europe, I can't honestly remember um, the other, which, which other one, um, I don't know, Ed or Susan, do y'all remember the four? I, I don't remember the other continent, but there were, I guess, five or six countries. And if that's a clue, I, mm -hmm. just, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't. But if somebody really wants to know, they can email the Lemon Project and we will get it to you. <laughs> We're going to kind of segue um, to um, the timeline. Um, and my first question is for Sean Glover. Um, and the uh, question is, discuss where, uh, where, we, where we're at, uh, where are we uh, in the memorial process, and what are the next steps? Sure. Um, this was a great follow-up to Jody. She brought you up to the fact that we um, selected the concept in April 2019 presented that to the board. And then from that point on, the building committee was created and actually began its work in July of 2019. Um, the building committee consisted of significant members of the Lemon uh, Project uh, Memorialization Committee and also um, others within the community that would be very helpful in making this process move forward. The project director is Greg Shipp. 
And so we began the process by actually um, opening it up for RFPs for architectural firms to present. And we uh, had the opportunity to hear presentations of the, art of the firms. And after that is, was over, we uh, selected Baskerville and we were very happy that uh, that decision was made. They presented a great uh, outline of, of how, the pro how they saw the project and how it came together. And that was very, very beneficial um, for us. After that, we uh, began working with Baskerville very closely. And Will Sender, who was the winning um, uh, winner for the concept, was actually working with Baskerville. And so we had an opportunity to work very closely with him and, and he could explain to us his concept and design and why it was, why he had chosen those things. So we did that, that process continued on. Um, it, I know we've been kind of quiet and invisible. So it looks like we haven't been working, but we really have been working. Um, it's just behind the scenes. Uh, there's a, this is an iter iterative and generative process. Um, we had to look at several designs. We had to decide what did we want? What were we looking for? Um, and then we had to uh, let Baskerville go back and figure out what we had said to them about the design requirements and then come back to us and, and review those things. And also in that process, we did a call for RFPs for construction managers and construction companies. And so we did that and had to hear those presentations and um, then make a selection. So throughout all of that process, it gets us to where we are today. Um, and as you know, the final approval has been announced today to the board um, that was presented to us by Baskerville. And we are really excited about that. Um, from, we have also reached our fundraising goal. So um, the fundraising started uh, early after the concept um, with several past rectors making great donations. And then we had uh, fundraising going on behind the scenes. And then uh, this year's One Tribe One Day, which is our fundraising day, the institution pivoted from its original plans because of the pandemic and focused all of our efforts on diversity and inclusion. And as a part of diversity and inclusion, the Lemon Project and the Memorial were parts were included in that. So as for One Tribe One Day, that was on June 23rd, we received a significant gift of $250,000 from Goody Tyler, who is an honorary alum. Um, and we were focused in on a goal of 2 million. So uh, this gift of 250,000 and 363 other donors combined $86,000 and put us at close to $500,000 raised for um, One Tribe One Day. And then since then, we have received at least uh, 250 or more thousand dollars. And uh, last week, we received, we received news that we had reached the, the one million. So to meet the, the two million, the Board of Visitors had committed to match one for one. So that got us to our um, desired goal for the project. So the fundraising was going on all the time in the, in the process. So here we are, we presented what the uh, finally, uh, final approved design is. From this point on, we still have some workings that we have to do. Baskerville has some work that it's doing to finalize all of the uh, drawings and renderings and they will get back to us. Then we have some uh, reviews from the design review, review board that we have to complete. And what we're hoping is that we will be able to soon get to a point where we'll have a building permit and get to, to hopefully start work early um, January 2021. Great. A lot of good news. Yes, very good news. Yeah, you kind of um, touched on the question about the timeline. Um, there was, so you kind of provided some, um, some shed some light on that. Um, and thank you for that very detailed uh, explanation. I'm quite sure our participants appreciate that. I want to move on to uh, Susan Glover. Um, I have a question. Uh, Susan Curran, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what is the timeline for archaeology 
And um, should archaeology uh, lead to previously unknown discoveries that required additional research, um, is the university prepared? Is the university prepared to investigate, uh, invest time and money uh, in that type of research? So I guess we can start with the first question: um, What is the timeline for archaeology? Um, William and Mary's campus is an important historic site. Uh, you know, we've got three hundred. 27 years of William and Mary history here uh, and, you know, potential always for Native American history uh, on the site before William and Mary uh, occupies it. Uh, and archaeology is something that we are required to do on, on state property before any kind of, of construction. Um, that said, historic campus uh, has already been excavated numerous times here and there, mostly because of construction projects or utility projects. Uh, and the area where the, the memorial is going, excuse me, has a number of those. But um, so, as, so as part of the construction process, the planning process, uh, we have an archaeological uh, contractor, uh, William and Mary's Center for Archaeological Research, uh, who is uh, doing, uh, preparing a, a, a a survey of previous archaeology in the area and evaluating where and working with, with the State uh, Department of Historic Resources on where we are required to do, do further work. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if we, if, if we find uh, important cultural uh, record there, then of, of course we will uh, we'll do everything within the compliance that the state requires and also to, to the research standards that an academic institution like William and Mary uh, needs uh, and you know the, the potential for discoveries is always great uh, you know and I have to say we're always a little relieved when archaeology doesn't stop construction but uh, you know the, the potential for new new research avenues is um, can, can be surprising and, and wonderful so archaeology is an unknown timeline um, but you know we always have to wave that flag and say could stop construction yeah. thank you so much and Bert, I have a question uh, for you uh, in terms of uh, when is the construction um, for the monument um, plan for? So as uh, Sean said, we're in the process of developing construction documents and we plan to be complete and ready to submit for permitting in early 2021. So hopefully early 2021 is when construction would start and our construction manager has outlined roughly a nine to 11 month construction schedule. Um, and when they hear me say nine months, I'm sure they're kind of screaming because. <laughs> and um, Jody, in terms of the timeline, uh, someone would like to know uh, how can students uh, play a role in the memorial process and how, how are students involved? Mute. I think you're muted again. Okay. <laughs> Students have been involved really since that, that class in, in 2014. And so certainly um, that was the, the, the class was an interesting um, one because there were probably about half of it was undergraduate students. We had one graduate student uh, two staff members and three members of the Williamsburg area community. So it was a real mix of um, constituencies. And so a lot of those people were the same people that stayed on, you know, for the committee. Now, of course, students graduate, you know, because that's their ultimate goal reason for coming to William and Mary is to get an education and leave. And so, but students have constantly cycled back on. So we've had, you know, new stu students um, throughout. And so, but other ways in terms of, um, we're, we're looking at ways um, to get the community at large involved with the monument. And so uh, we're not ready to divulge those yet, but we're looking at ways for, you know, for people to be involved. Also students who may want to um, just be involved with the Lemon Project, we also have the Lemon Project Society, which is um, mainly undergraduate students, but we do have some graduate students who are interested in um, the, the, you know, the, the Lemon Project itself. 
but um, we're also always open to uh, responding to student emails if they're in, you know if they're interested in um, you know working either to do some of the research because one of the things we're still doing um, is looking for as many names as of the enslaved as we can find and the names will actually go on the monument and so we're up to 186 um, people either names or um, in some ways, I guess you might call them sightings because a lot of times people are mentioned uh, by a skill, um, you know, the carpenter, or they might be mentioned as someone who, you know, this person ran an errand. So we don't have their names, but we know the date and the place they were mentioned. Um, and so those, so we have 186 at this point and we're finding, you know, some, you know, um, every, almost every time anybody goes into the archive to look. And so if, you know, if, if people are interested in uh, uh, assisting with that research, and I have to, you know, certainly have to say the caveat with that is, um, you know, COVID and getting to the archives and, and all of that. But um, there are opportunities for student research. We want, uh, excuse me, student input um, and again, there, we hope that there will be a way for all of us to literally participate um, in, um, in the memorial itself in terms of um, bringing it together. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Our next section uh, deals with um, space use. Um, and it's, uh, the first question is for Susan Kern. Um, and the question is, can you talk a bit more about where, uh, can you talk about where the memorial will be located on the campus? When uh, the Committee on Memorialization for the Lemon Project launched this memorial, wrote, wrote the proposal for it, it was very important to the committee, um, myself as, as part of that, but to the students, alumni, and community members on the committee, uh, that it be located on historic campus. Uh, and so that was one of the first challenges with, or among the first challenges with the uh, memorialization process was to argue that this was important enough to go on William and Mary's most iconic and most important, arguably most important uh, historic uh, part of campus, but uh, historic campus is the historical site of slavery, uh, and uh, historic campus de defined uh, both the, the spatial, uh, uh, the area that William and Mary occupied, as well as the, the vi it's the visual reference for for William and Mary. Uh, so the the memorial, uh, the winning design, the 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 design competition allowed uh, challenged. Uh, designers uh, to to uh, to decide uh, you know to to uh, to recommend to us where they thought the memorial should go on historic campus and we had a range of uh, designs from the east front of the Wren building the west side facing the, the college uh, the you know all, all different areas of historic campus. The one that won uh, is located to the south side of, of the college building, the Wren building, between the, the Wren building and Jamestown Road. Uh, and strategically, it breaks through a, a 1932 wall that was put there to define the boundaries of William and Mary's historic campus. Um, the wall uh, came up in, in the work that Jody and Ed did uh, with their class, that the, that the wall kind of came up as, as a symbol to the community that there were walls around William and Mary to keep them out. So one of the things that this memorial does is break through that wall and, and impose kind of a, an, an intervention in into how we tell history here. Uh, the memorial is the first uh, thing built on historic campus since 1932, since the Rockefeller restoration. Um, so it is challenging the, this, the sort of the visual order of campus that's been in place for almost 100 years. Uh, you know, and um, so it, it is that important to us uh, and it's, it's that important to, uh, you know, to, to how we tell history. Um, thank you for that. I wanted to, I have another question for, um, for Sean uh, Glover, um, is how will the university make sure the memorial is a central space, um, 
on campus? I would say for all of the reasons that, that Susan just mentioned, um, it has significant presence in the historic campus and that's gonna be very important. Um, everyone pretty much goes through historic campus, walks through whether it's guests or our current students. And so it is a grand um, structure and it, it has a lot of gravitas and it's gonna welcome people in. Um, and so it will be a significant part I think the exciting part we were talking earlier, you know, it's this has been 10 years in the making and to be at this point is just exciting. Um, it's a culmination of a decade of research done by Dr. Allen and the Lemon Project. And it also kind of bridges the, um, the time that we will have to gather more research, more names and more information. So um, as this process, been, process has been going along, it's generated a lot of excitement. Um, because I think students have been very eager to learn about the Lemon Project and learn about the untold histories of William & Mary, and because William & Mary was one of the first institutions to really acknowledge its past and its connections to slavery, um, this, this is really a, a physical, tangible way of culminating all of that information and making it significant to our campus. The one thing I would say, is that as we were in the iter iter iterative um, redesign process, one of the things we realized, um, as Susan said, we had broken through the wall, but also we realized that the placement is literally right across the street from the admission office. And that is a place where all tours to the campus began and there's a lot of foot traffic there. And so what we're hoping it is that the um, memorial will serve as a new pathway and a new welcoming to the campus. And, and as the design has been created, we've created an opportunity from the side facing that area that there's an opening and, and kind of a welcoming in for the campus and a way to come into it and really learn about the history. And so we're hoping that this whole area will be a gateway to welcoming people in to the to, to learning about our history, but also to be very um, reverent and respectful of the sacred space. And um, so we're looking forward to, to that new gateway opportunity. And with all the programming that's gonna be in place, I think we'll, we'll really have an opportunity to make it central. Right. Um, my next question was for, um, for Jody, um, how can, and either of you, uh, Jody or Sean Glover can answer this, is how can the community members use this space and will there be uh, preferences on what groups can use this space? We haven't gotten to policy development yet around use of the space, but certainly um, as, as Susan mentioned, when we were sitting around that table coming up with the competition um, guidelines and what have you. One of the things we um, really want to, um, to see is that it is a used space that people can come for different kinds of gatherings. Um, they can come just to sit and, and contemplate. They can come and study. They can come and you know, uh, talk to their friends. They can look at the names of these um, people who none of us um, knew and who didn't know us and probably could not in their wildest dreams imagine this memorial. Um, and so we are hoping it will be a space also that people in the greater Williamsburg community will come to. They will, they will bring family reunion groups. They will come to take pictures. They will come to remember um, there's a more than a good chance that there are many descendants of these people um, living in the Williamsburg, um, the greater Williamsburg area. So that, so we hope that that people will see it as a space for them. It'll be a space of welcoming. Um, as Sean was saying, it will be, you know, it's it's going to be at this kind of new entrance to the to the campus, and so. Um, it's one of the first things that that people will see. Um, so I, you know, I I could see um, poetry readings there. I could see music. Um, uh, 
other ceremonial types of events. There are lots of traditions at William and Mary, you know, um, the ringing of the wren bell at, at commencement, at, you know, walking through the wren from one, from the front to, um, to the back at um, co um, convocation, the um, graduation, you know, walk through the wren um, over to um, now the stadium. There are all these, these kinds of wonderful, you know, traditions, but I'm, we're hoping that this um, memorial will become a new site of tradition um, for William and Mary students, that it will be as important to incoming freshmen as it is to outgoing seniors and, and all you know, in between. And so, um, but you know, again, we haven't come to the policy situation yet, so, um, but there will be um, you know, opportunities, I think, hopefully for people to just come bring their lunch and hang out. And my, my next question is for, um, for Bert Pennick. Uh, what kind of events uh, can be held um, at this space? And will there be AV hookups um, and the equipment that will be needed to hold the different types of events at this space? Yeah, so um, first of all, as, as, as Jody was saying, we want to make sure that we provide the infrastructure. When, when I say infrastructure, things like electricity and lighting around this memorial so that it can be used in any number of ways. We also uh, have focused on making sure that there's enough flexibility so we don't kind of limit how, how the space can be used um, while respecting the, the concept that won the competition of the heart. So ho hopefully we've, we've, we've paved the way for any number of opportunities for, for the space to be used in any number of different ways. Thank you so much for that. One uh, of the things that, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say one of the things I didn't say that it may be obvious is that when people take their classes outside, this could be a space for class, a space for research too, so. Yeah. Um, is there a plan for memorializing those individuals uh, whose names um, or identifying information can't be found uh, in the design? Um, and that's a question for you to, to follow up on those who are unnamed. You said the, that's it, is the, the question. Unnamed? Yes, it's yes. Just people who cannot be identified. Right. Um, we're not sure exactly, but yes, uh, how it will look, it, it, whether it would say unnamed and a date, you know, where, where, we, where, where they were found in the record. It may say unknown and a date. Um, for the, it may say um, a carpenter. We know for, you know, we know in, I think, 1831, William Mary hired a carpenter to do some work on the Wren building, or the college building, as it was called. Um, we don't know who that person was yet. And so it may say there, um, uh, if they had a particular um, craft, you know, that they were known for or whatever. So we're still working on that. But yes, they will be um, even if we can't name them, um, we, they will be recognized on the wall. Okay. And I have another question um, for our Ed Pease. Uh, what kind of educational materials will surround the memorial? Um, that's a great question, and that's an ongoing conversation that the committee has had as well as you know all the other various people involved in it. And I think we really do want this to be not just a physical memorial, although that was critical to the whole goal of this effort. We want it to be a living thing and that it's ongoing and it is involved in education. So, and we're not just talking about plaques or kiosks, although that has certainly entered into the conversation, but we would like the opportunity for advocating research and um, that kind of thing as to where and how that happens and what, what is its direct connection to the memorial that's still in discussion, but, but it is a big, that, that will happen. That's, that's, sorry to be, I'm not being evasive. We just, it just needs a lot more discussion. But the one thing I wanted to add, and it sort of touched on one of the other questions I read in the Q and A is um, asking about um, the other submissions to the to the competition and so forth and this does kind of have to do with the educational mission too 
one thing that we've talked about from the very beginning is that we'd like to have the very beginning of, of the whole process of doing the competition. We'd like to have an exhibition at some point with all the submissions for the competition and whether that's a physical exhibition or a virtual one that's to be decided too. But I think it, it'd be really um, informative and interesting for the public to see what these other submissions were and to see how people conceptualize the idea of memorializing the enslaved and men, women, and children who built the college. And there are some very compelling ones. I think, I think the winning scheme, which was unanimous, I think it hit, it hit all the right notes. And by the way, I should say the kind of bore out our hope that um, it, it wouldn't just be, you know, previously accomplished professionals who m might design this thing, that it ended up being uh, <clears throat> a graduate who was architect yet. And we're really pleased that he, that Baskerville associated with them. It's a great team. But um, again, my main point, at some point we will assemble all these, these um, the submissions for the competition for an exhibition. And hopefully that will be part of the educational um, outreach for the, for the memorial. I mean, I have another question about, um, and this is for, um, for everyone, really. Um, can you discuss the ways in which you are thinking of, of programming around the memorial, um, but also thoughts on ways the process and the memorial can, lever can be leveraged to serve ongoing social justice initiatives um, and the needs uh, on the campus and the community? And that question is open um, to anyone. Um, if you want to take the first part of that, or could you discuss the ways that and what you are thinking of programming around the about programming surrounding the memorial? Well, I, I mean, I think like I had um, mentioned earlier that I, I hope it will come a, a, a place of um, celebration and commemoration um, that, and contemplation, certainly. Um, and, you know, for example, we have um, something every year. We have a, 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 during commencement weekend called Dining of the Kente, which is a ceremony for um, graduating, uh, for graduates, because undergrads and professional students and graduate students. And so, you know, I could see that a place that we line up maybe is at the, at the memorial. Um, the, um, the Lemon Project sponsors with the support of Patrick Hudgens in the Counseling Center, we sponsor every day, at the end of every semester, we have a drum circle um, certainly, I see the drum circle taking place at the memorial. Um, and so I think there, you know, there may be things certainly that we haven't um, thought of, um, possibly plays, um, spoken word um, events, um, musical events. Um, so I think, you know, I think um, there are things that we haven't even thought of that um, could possibly take place there. Um, so I'll turn it over to you know, someone else. Well, I'll add on. I think there's what's nice, uh, what becomes really wonderful about these kinds of spaces is, for example, we have another space in Richmond that is a small plaza, but because of its its significance in in this history, it has become a place of gathering. For example, when Senator Kane, Mayor Stoney and several congressmen and council people wanted to speak after the murders of George Floyd, that's where they gathered. Um, after the events in Charlottesville and the murder of Heather Heyer, that became the space that they gathered in. So it has become sort of this place of healing for people. And it's not you know, a large public space, but it has a symbolism and significance that draws people to it. And I certainly believe that this will become that place. And certainly as that um, bridge, if you will, between the university and the town, between the community and those that have been enslaved by, um, 
it'll be that place of, of gathering, I think. At least I will, I'll come there. <laughs> you You'll so. always be welcome, Bert. <laughs> I'd, like to, I, I'd like to weigh in on this also. Um, it, William and Mary's historic campus is part of the tourism apparatus of the town of Williamsburg and the greater historic uh, historic triangle. Uh, uh, and um, I, I, I'm particularly excited that this monument um, will engage people who, who stop by just to see what William and Mary is about. Or maybe they heard that Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe went to William and Mary. Uh, and, and they're coming because of that. And, and maybe they don't take a tour of the Wren building or maybe they do, but to have this, this physical place where then people will encounter this as a site of African-American history also that acknowledges William and Mary's long history with slavery, uh, but then also says, you know, that, that this is not just the story of uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, white ancestors. Uh, this is also uh, a significant place of, of African-American history. Um, so, you know, the day-to-day, the, -day, the small encounters, I'm hoping will very much be part of this. I'd like to jump in too, if I could. Um, I think as we, uh, as it evolves and, and the structure continues to be built, I really hope that students will, will find a way to engage with it and, and own it and feel really comfortable and find ways to utilize it, uh, whether it's about current situations or future situations, um, whether it's speaking out, you know, or serving as a place of honor. I hope that will evolve as the, the structure is being um, being built. The one thing I know that we're ready to use it for is um, we were scheduled to host the area's uh, first Juneteenth celebration this, this past summer. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were not able to do that and we have rescheduled it for this coming June. And so we have uh, worked with uh, Bird and the construction company to make sure that we have a moment to pause on June 19th in the actual construction process and host the Juneteenth celebration there. We're doing that in partnership with the NAACP, the local chapter of NAACP, the city of Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg and Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. And so it's really a way of bringing the community in. And that has been one of the premises of the Lemon Project from the beginning, is to make sure that we engage the community in this, in this process. And um, we hope that we will also have an opportunity to honor uh, all of the names that will be listed and, and also to uh, ritualistically um, have a moment and, and a sacred moment for uh, what the structure stands for and what it means, but also what it will mean in the future as a part of the Juneteenth celebration. So uh, June 19th is already on the calendar as a scheduled event, even though it won't be fully constructed, but uh, we have gotten uh, approval from our partners to say that they will pause for a moment for us to do that. And hopefully if this is an annual event that is continued, that this will be the spot that we will do this every year. Great, that's phenomenal. I had another question. Uh, this is actually um, to you, um, Sean. Um, is, where is the money uh, from, from the memorial coming from? And will there be opportunities to donate bricks similar to the alumni house and other spaces on campus? Well, I, I jumped the gun on your question and, and said that earlier because I was so excited. Um, so we have reached the, the fundraising goal that we had anticipated, which was um, the two million and that, that, of course, came from generous donors, uh, alumni, friends, community organizations. And so that money has been raised. Um, and I think what we will, the second part of your question was, what are we going to, what will there be opportunities for, um, will there be opportunities? Bricks. For bricks, yes. Bricks, yes. We have not made that decision yet. Um, that will be something we have be, we have begun discussing it, but we don't know exactly how we're going to do that. Um, if we do it, it will be a concerted effort and, and it will be something that will be both open to the community and to our alumni. Um, it, this, this, I think, is going to be very significant for our alums and especially our, our Black, Indigenous, people of color alumni 
who have really um, had some emotional trauma through, throughout this process and, and dealing with a lot of issues. And, and I hope that making this visible will create that opportunity and they'll wanna be a part of uh, building this together and, and making sure that it lasts. So we don't have a final decision on that, but it is on the table for discussion. We have some, um, some concluding questions uh, and everyone can chime in on this. Um, what memorials like this, um, what, memor what do memorials like this mean in the context of the current events, um, like the taking down of the Confederate iconography um, in nearby Richmond and beyond in terms of what's happening in our retention in the nation? Um, how does this, uh, what does this memorial mean in the context of that? And anyone can answer that question. Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, do I think that it is, um, it represents what, what we uh, as a whole society place value on and continue to place value on and what represents us contemporarily. Um, there is uh, the idea of memorials and those types of things that want to represent the ideals and the ideas of universities, cultures, societies, and, and when we can look at things like this, I think what it says is this is something that is important. And so the weaving, I'll say the weaving back together of a full American history is what this represents. And hopefully this will sort of certainly continue. So I'll just shut up now. <laughs> You're fine. Thanks for that. Anyone else like to um, chime in on that question? I'll, I'll weigh in here. Um, in 2015, William and Mary removed from campus uh, a, uh, a tablet with uh, Confederate symbols on it that was in the entry hall of the Wren building uh, and also the uh, symbols that were on the college mace. Uh, and we are engaging critically with what our built environment, what, what the material culture of campus says to people um, who uh, may encounter it without understanding uh, layers and layers and, and years and years of history. Uh, you know, and, and so I think a memorial like this, as well as the, you know, the critical engagement with what is in, what is on public land in small towns and large cities, uh, you know, is all part of thinking about what, what does our, what do our public spaces say about our values? How does, how do, how does our built environment represent us, um, both to people who, who have kind of the, the background on it, but, but also people who might encounter it without that. Um, so I, I, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, this is very much all within a, a large kind of reckoning with history uh, and what William and Mary's history says about what should be uh, in, it, in its most important spaces. Thank you so much. I, I would just say that I think, in my opinion, what we experienced this summer and continue to experience um, has, has been a defining moment. I think it is not, it's not unlike, unfortunately, the, the things that we've experienced in the past, but I think there's a difference here that there are people who are coming together to really try to uh, dismantle systemic racism, structural racism, um, and really a, a, an awakening and a reckoning with our country and where we are. And I think uh, we didn't plan for the, the memorial to be uh, built during this time or constructed during this time, but I do think it, it's an affirming piece uh, that will be added to our campus that will allow us to acknowledge even further how important an inclusive history is. Okay. And, um, and so that's just my take on it. Thanks for that. Um, and this was, um, and you kind of just answered the, the other question. Uh, it was how do uh, we hope that the memorial will change the, um, the mindset um, on campus or kind of influence the campus culture. Um, I kind of touched on that a bit in your last comment, but if you want to follow up a bit more, you're, you're welcome to.
Well, I think, I mean, just to add to, <clears throat> um, you know, what's, what's been said is the, the campus right now, the population, well, actually doesn't fully reflect the population, but in terms of the iconography, it reflects the population of the 18th and 19th century. You know, the, the, the people on campus now, it's a much more diverse um, group of people and the, the, the landscape should reflect that. And so I think with this um, memorial, it will begin to do, to do that. And also it just says these, as we know of now, 186 people um, who lived and, and toiled at William and Mary for no compensation for 172 years must be remembered. And they must be remembered in a grand way. And so that's what this does. It remembers them, it acknowledges them, it humanizes them. Absolutely. Just can I add one more thing to that? Um, that what Jody just said kind of illustrates uh, a sentiment that was really strong with the Lemon Project Committee for memorialization mm -hmm. with students and everyone else that this be a physical place, a physical thing, so that it could not be ignored, it could not be missed, because I think, and one sort of side tangent to that, I think so often when a, a visitor or a tourist comes to a place like William and Mary, it's so easy to see it as this beautiful park-like campus and wonderful buildings, and isn't this lovely, and without really thinking about it, this, this is the way it's always been, what an idyllic place, and the memorial as Bert alluded to, kind of weaves the more of a complete history together of these people who previously have been unseen, unmentioned, and now there's a physical memorial to their work, to their toil, to the families who built the college. And um, that's, I think, sort of at the essence of what this thing is. Thanks for that. I would say personally for me, it is, um, I, it's, a, it's a debt of gratitude because I, you know, as a person who works at William and Mary and who is also an alum, um, to me, this will serve as a way in which I am honoring the people whose shoulders I stand on. And, 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 and hopefully also the William and Mary that we hope it will become. And so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will do that. You know, sometimes mindset is hard to change, but um, it, it, it's, a one, it's one step at a time. And I definitely think the memorial will help us to do that. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll, I'll also weigh in here that, um, you know, from the start, the, the Committee on Memorialization wanted a physical memorial uh, and the 2007 student resolution wanted a physical memorial, but the entire process has also been um, backed by the idea that the memorial is not the only thing, that, memori that, that the physical memorial is only part of, of scholarships, of courses, of endowed professors, of institutions that, institutes that study this history. Um, you know, so, so it, it, it is part, it is one of many, many things. It's the beginning of memorialization. It certainly isn't the end of this conversation. Absolutely. And, and Susan, there's another question and it just kind of, kind of relates to your, your statement. Um, it's, uh, how is the memorial, um, or does the placement of the memorial uh, juxtapose the James Monroe um, statue in front of Tucker? Um, you know, there, there are a number of questions that come up here and sort of what's the relationship of this memorial to other memorials on campus. Um, this memorial is very much in its own space and it's a completely different, not, not just uh, style as in, in architecture, but, but a completely different kind of memorial than the others. Uh, most of the other memorials on campus are, 
a classically shaped pedestal with a, a sculptural figure on top. You know, we've got Badetat, who's been in the Ren Yard since, uh, since 1801. We've got, uh, you know, Monroe in front of Tucker Hall. We've got, you know, the Jefferson statue that was a gift from University of Virginia for, for our church centenary. Uh, you know, Blair and the Tylers, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this is a completely different kind of memorial and it should be because the, the work that this memorial is being asked to do is not something that can take that classical form of, of a, you know, metal or marble figure on a classically designed pedestal, right? It, it, it needs to be a different vocabulary, a different kind of experience. So, um, you know, while it is like other sculptural things on campus. It, it is not like them as far as the, the work they do uh, memorializing. Thank you. Can I just jump in real quick? I'll be quick. Because there was a question also from someone, <clears throat> other than giving money, what can I do? Yes. I think it's recognizing that the forms of memorial, the way we commemorate things, the way we talk about architecture, the way we talk about the sort of master plans of college campuses, is based in a culture for which we, people like me, did not necessarily have a part in. So what I'm, the call to action here is to ask, what is the structural bias that exists in everything we see, touch, and do in the places that we inhabit, in the things that we make, in the way we speak? Understand that, to understand better just our, our entire environment. And so there's no reason why I think a memorial of this nature should even really be asked to speak to one of the other. Now I'm gonna really move forward. Thank you. And this question um, for you, uh, Jody, is how will the community, uh, university community, educate new students, faculty and staff, and the broader community about, um, about this memorial? Um, well, I, I think one, just, you know, using it, right, um, having, having events there. I think um, a, another a very simple response is, you know, every potential um, William & Mary student as a high school student visiting campus will see this memorial, right? Um, <clears throat> so hopefully they will come in knowing about um, this memorial. I think, um, you know, just in, in, in coursework, you know, as if people, as faculty talk about slavery, um, they now have um, a place, a location on campus to talk about slavery at William and Mary. Um, and we are providing also, you know, inf research inf information through the website and, and we do class visits and that type of thing. And so, um, and we also go into the into the broader community, um, <clears throat> and so you know, and also you know, there are always ideas that people email us with that we haven't thought of that is a way of educating um, current students and the community. So I think it's kind of um, endless in some ways, and hopefully, I notice in the chat there's a as a question of you know. Uh, why every freshman, and I guess it's every, why doesn't every freshman maybe take a class on this history at William and Mary? And, and there, but there are classes that use this information. And I teach a class called Beyond the Plantation. And it was really inspired by the idea that um, most people uh, don't understand that slavery was not limited um, to the plantation, that slavery took place on college and university campuses. It took place in churches, in the general store, um, in, in industry, it was everywhere. And so there are ways that this information is being incorporated and taught. And maybe down the road, there will be, you know, a history of William and Mary class that everyone has to take. And, you know, certainly um, this story will be included in it. So. I, I'll just also say I think um, we would miss an opportunity if we did not include it as a part of the tours for the students who come here, but it also in, in the orientations for faculty, staff, and students, that this becomes embedded in William & Mary's history. 
and the, the importance of everything that we know. Um, and also to make sure that we utilize the community to tell the story, whether we're go through the Chamber of Commerce or you know, any of those places. I, I think we miss an opportunity if we don't um, proactively get out there and share this and make sure that it's not overlooked um, as people come to campus and visit. So thanks for that. Well, wow, an hour has gone by. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything anyone would like to say um, in concluding this, uh, this conversation? It's been a, a wonderful conversation and I hope that we answered as many questions as possible for our, um, our guests and our attendees. Um, but if there's anything you would like to say in closing? If you still have questions, um, lemon at wm.edu, please email us uh, and we'll try to um, answer them for you. With that said, I, I I think it's I think it's important for us also to um, to thank the donors, all the friends and, and alumni who have who have given and and made this possible. Um, I think we need to thank the Lemon Project and and the leadership of Jody Allen in making this uh, a possibility. And I think we would be remiss if we did not thank the board thank the board of visitors and and President Rowe for their leadership and support to make sure that this um, becomes a reality. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> for the next, follow us, follow the, uh, check out the Lemon website, Lemon Project website at w, uh, William and Mary uh, to learn about our upcoming porch talks. Um, if you have any questions about the uh, project, feel free to reach out to us and we will gladly um, answer your questions and assist you. That's it. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you, Jawan. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.